So you can use that bulletin to be able to take good sermon notes as Pastor Brian gets ready to come up. Let's give him a big hand clap. Pastor Brian. Amen. God is good. All the time. Amen. Good to be in the house of the Lord this morning and to see uh, everybody coming to honor. Anybody love Jesus in the house? Amen. We also want to welcome our online viewers. Let's make some noise for those watching online. We live stream every Sunday at 10, 15 a.m. I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles to James chapter 5. James chapter 5 verse 7 is going to be the uh, focus of our study this morning. And I hope you came with a spiritual appetite. I hope you came to learn God's word. I hope you came to uh, receive instruction from God's word, inspiration from God's word, and if need be, correction from God's word. Amen? James chapter 5, verse 7 through 11. When everybody's there, say amen. As you're turning there, just want to remind you we are looking for people to serve once a month on Sundays. We have opportunities to serve on the host team or the operations team or the children's ministry team, worship team, sound team, video team. We got some spaces and places for you to give back to the Lord. So if you want to give back to the Lord at least once a month, uh, sign up on the flap of the bulletin and somebody will contact uh, you. Let's turn this monitor down just a little bit, just a little bit. Uh, James chapter 5 Verses 7, when everybody's there, say amen. amen. Therefore, be patient. Someone say patient. Amen. Patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. How long do you need to be patient for? Until you get paid? Until next week? No, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and later rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Notice it says establish your hearts. I want you to notice that because oftentimes you don't have power to control what's around you, but you have power to control what's inside of you. And as long as your insides, your heart is strong, uh, you could endure what's going on around you. Can someone say amen to that? So God is often concerned about the status or the health of your heart, your spiritual heart. Because if your heart remains strong, you will persevere. But the moment that what's on the outside begins to creep on the inside, that's when you begin to sink. People sink when they allow the outside to creep on the inside. Boats sink when they allow what's on the outside to creep on the inside. So don't allow what's on the outside to creep on the inside. Establish your heart. Don't have an anxious heart. Don't have a worrisome heart. Have an established heart. For the coming of the Lord is at hand. Look at verse 9. Do not grumble, 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 grumble. Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Someone say patience. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. Let us pray. Father, we open up your word for understanding. We pray that you help us to look at your word, understand your word, and feed off of your word that we might obey it. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone says, Amen. Amen. Uh, my brothers and sisters, one of the most important things you'll learn as a citizen of the kingdom of God is how to respond uh, correctly uh, when you are wronged, when you're wronged. 
Um, has anybody ever learned so far uh, that sometimes life is unfair? Has anybody ever learned that yet, right? If you haven't learned that, just keep on living. Eventually, you'll learn that life at time is unfair. And as citizens, as ambassadors of the kingdom, uh, we need to learn how to respond when people uh, treat us wrong. Now, the writer of this text that we're studying this morning is uh, a man by the name of James. Someone say James. And James is teaching us how to respond correctly when wrong. And he's writing to Christians who are scattered uh, throughout the land and are being persecuted uh, for their faith. Uh, they are being imprisoned, they are being tortured, and they are being killed. And James um, scribbles this letter in part to help them to, to endure what they're going through, to give them insight on how to respond uh, to affliction. Now, the brother James, um, he speaks uh, with the power of the Holy Spirit, but he also speaks through experience. Someone say experience. Um, it, it's, it's powerful when you speak uh, through experience because that means you've been through a couple things. That means you've, you've been through a couple things. You don't want nobody who's never raised kids to try to teach you how to raise kids, right? Uh, they, they need to talk about another subject, right? Because why? They have not had experience in uh, that area. And so James, um, this brother, uh, had experienced lots of pain in his life. He experienced uh, lots of affliction in his family. He was the baby brother of Jesus. He was the baby brother of Jesus. You know what that means? That means he experienced the death of his older brother. That means he experienced the murder of his older brother. He experienced the gruesome crucifixion of his older brother. And he experienced the emotions, the depressions, the feelings that came through that. Yet he endured it and went on to serve the Lord and make a contribution uh, for the kingdom of God. Not only did he experience pain through his family, uh, but he himself uh, was a victim of much persecution. History teaches us that um, people begin to hate on James because of his faith and they begin to plot uh, after him and they took him on top of the roof of the temple to try to kill him and history teaches that they threw James off of the roof and when he landed on the ground miraculously he did not die but when the mob noticed he was not dead they ran from the roof and they ran and surrounded him and they beat him to death with a stick they beat him to death with the stick so when you when you when we read these words from James we read somebody who has experienced a lot of affliction in life he has experienced a lot of pain so he talks by the power of the holy spirit but he also talks by power of experience he knows what he is talking about and his life is a lesson that teaches us that that we are we are to be loving people even if it's a risk to love people. His life is a lesson that teaches us loving people is a risk that we must take for the sake of the gospel. I'm going to say that again. We're going to put it up on the screen. Loving people is a risk we must take for the sake of of the gospel. We are called to love um, different people. We are called to love people that are different than us. We are called to love people that are difficult. Someone say difficult. We are called to love different people and we are called to love difficult people. Now, that's not easy because we love to be around people that, that act like us, talk like us, like what we like and dislike what we like. So we like the easy way out. But since when has God called his people to do anything that is easy? 
We are called, my brothers and sisters, to love different people and difficult people. You don't get any brownie points for loving people that love you. You don't get any brownie points for liking people that treat you well. In fact, Jesus spoke about this. You don't have to turn there, but just listen to what Jesus says in Luke chapter 6. He says, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Anybody catch that? Even sinners love those who love them, but love your enemies, do good to them. Then your reward will be great and you will be children of the most high because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful just as your father is merciful. I like the statement that Jesus makes. He says, then your reward will be great and you will be children of the most high because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. How do you know your child is your child? How do you know your daughter is your daughter? How do you know your son is your son? You know in part because they act like you, they talk like you, and they resemble you. Amen? How do you know one is a child of God? How do you know one is a follower of Jesus Christ? Well, you know because they're supposed to resemble Jesus. They're supposed to act like Jesus, supposed to talk like Jesus, and they are to respond to difficult times like Jesus. Someone say amen to that. So James, he writes to help us to respond when people uh, do us wrong. And I just want to pull out a couple spiritual reflections for our learning. Someone say number one. Number one, uh, remain the same. Remain the same. I find it very interesting that four times James mentions the word patience. Trip on this in verse seven. He says, be patient. At the end of verse seven, he talks about a farmer being patient waiting for his crop. In verse eight, he says, you also must be patient. In verse 10, he gives an example of the prophets being patient. So notice this, four times James uses the word uh, patience. Why do you think he uses this word so many times? Why do you think he repeats himself four times? I have a suggestion. I believe it's because many of us haven't been patient. Can we talk like family this morning? Let's tell the truth and shame the devil. How many of us have failed the patient test in the last month? How many of us have failed the patient test in the last two hours? Hello, somebody. If you're easily frustrated, you have an issue with patience. If you're quick to point out wrong in somebody or something, you have an issue with patience. If you snap at your children for minor things, you have an issue with patience. If you get mad at your pastor, no, I'm just saying. I just, I just threw that in there. Let me just say this. If you are alive, you have an issue with patience. I should have got more amens than that. If you're alive, right? If you are alive, you have an issue with patience. You know why? Because everybody has an issue with patience. It's something that we must constantly wrestle with, what we must constantly go to prayer in. It is something that we must constantly overcome. I want to suggest to you that we live in the most impatient generation ever. Most impatient generation ever. We don't walk anymore. We drive cars. And we honk at people when they're too slow. I will honk at a brother real fast. I'll just honk at him. Many of us, we don't even cook anymore. We use microwaves. And then we pull it out even before the ding happens. You know why? Because we're impatient. When, when, I, when I grew up, when I was growing up, um, the drive throughs had one lane in it. One lane in it. Not today. Uh -uh. I've seen drive throughs with three lanes in it. You know why? Because one is not fast enough. We need to get it faster. And I, I would dare say that some of y'all even thinking in your mind, I hope this sermon ain't too long. Uh, yeah, yeah. And I'm, I'm praying for the discernment to figure out which one of you have been thinking about that. And I think ding, 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 ding is going on. 
But the Bible talks a lot about patience. And I just want to remind us because oftentimes we have selective memory. Oftentimes we have selective memory, not forgetful memory, but selective memory. And we choose to forget some things that we don't want to deal with. And the Bible talks a lot about patience in so much that patience is a fruit of the spirit. It is a fruit of the spirit. Galatians 5.22 says the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, pay, uh, uh, peace, and patience. So if you're flowing in the spirit, he will produce patience in your life. One, one way you measure spiritual growth is by checking your level of patience. You want to know if you've been growing spiritually? Just check your level of patience. How do you know if one's been filled with the Holy Ghost or not? How do you know if one's been baptized in the Holy Ghost or not? Some will tell you uh, the evidence is speaking in tongues. I will suggest and, and suggest to you that even more so the evidence is speaking the language of patience. Even more so, the evidence of being filled with the Holy Spirit is living a life that speaks the language of patience. Why is that? Because patience is what God shows us. Patience is what God shows us. In fact, the apostle Peter says in 2 Peter 3, 3, he says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. So God is not slow. God is not slow. He's patient. He's waiting for you to turn back to him. He's waiting for you to repent. He's waiting for some of y'all to come to your senses. He's waiting for some of y'all to start thinking right, start acting right. He is patient with you. And one of the things I always want to remind people is don't misinterpret God's patience with, with approval. Don't misinterpret God's patience with approval. Just because he's not punishing you right now for the bad that you're doing does not mean he approves of the bad that you're doing. He's being patient with you. He's being kind with you. He's being merciful with you. He's hoping that you'll wake up and come back to your senses. It's God. He waits for us. Now, the Greek word for patience is actually two words. Um, it's a combination of long and tempered. Long and tempered. And the word tempered has the idea of consistency. Someone say consistency. Now, this is what James is teaching us. That a consistent person has a pattern of remaining the same. A consistent person has a pattern of remaining the same. Get this. A consistent person stays true to who they are and what God has called them to be regardless of what they face in life. Anybody follow along? A consistent person stays true to who they are and what God has called them to be regardless of what they face in life. In fact, James points this out in verse 10. He says, for example of patience and suffering, look at the Lord's prophets. We know how happy they are now because they stayed true. Right? They're, they're happy because they stay true. They don't have any regrets because while they're going through, they stay true. Some of y'all should have wrote that down right there. They don't have any regrets because while they were going through what they were going through, they stay true to who they are and who God has called them to be. Is anybody picking up what I'm putting down? And James, he actually gives another evidence of this example of this. He says, look to Job. Look to Job. You remember Job. Job lost his family. Job lost his health. Job lost his home. Uh, but he stayed true to who he was. Even when his wife told him, why don't you just cuss God out and die? He stayed true. And James points out that in the end, Job realized his purpose. In the end, Job realized God's purpose. In the end, God, Job realized God's purpose. I'm going to say that again. In the end, not while he was going through it, but in the end, he realized God's purpose. This is why you cannot give up easily. This is why you can't throw in the towel easily. Because oftentimes you don't realize the purpose of a thing until you press through the thing. 
Does this make sense to anybody? Oftentimes you don't realize the purpose of what you're going through until you go through. That's why you can't throw in the towel. That's why you can't give up. Too many of us give up easily. You don't realize the purpose of why you're going through it until you go through it. That's why you don't give up. I was being interviewed uh, by the Long Beach Post last Wednesday right here in the church. And they contacted me and they wanted to do a story about um, what God is doing uh, in my life. And they began to ask me questions about, you know, my life. And um, after I told them, you know, all the things that I went through... Uh, all the things that I suffered and I shared with them about how the 16 years in prison and doing a life sentence um, The man told me he says Brian How is your life now? Man after all you've been through how is what you went through affecting your life now? And I looked the guy in the camera. I said man today I'm living my dreams Today I'm living out my purpose and I didn't realize it then I didn't realize it while I was going through it in fact I didn't realize it until after I went through it and I thank God that he gave me the strength not to throw in the towel I thank God because now I understand now what I went through has made me the person that I am today. Now I can say with the scripture that I'm, I thank God that I was afflicted, that I may learn his word, right? But I didn't understand it back then. I had to go through it first. Some of y'all are going through something right now. You don't understand. You feel like giving up. You're crying. You're, 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 you're being pressed on every side. And I just want to let you know, don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. Be consistent. Be who God called you to be. Do what God called you to do. Regardless of what happens. And so James, James says, don't let situations transform you into someone else. That's what he's saying. He's saying, don't let someone pull you out of who you are. That's what he's saying. Don't let situations transform you into someone you're not. That's what he's saying. Don't let problems and people, don't, don't let your coworker bring somebody out of you that you're not. That's what he's saying. Don't, don't let afflictions turn you into somebody God did not call you to be. Listen. People do wrong when they forget who they are. Under affliction, under pressure, the enemy tries to get us to forget who we are. And the moment we forget who we are, we turn into someone we're not. The moment we forget who we are, we do things in accordance with somebody we are not. The devil can get you to forget who you are, then he can get you to act like someone you're not. This is powerful because you got many people who do wrong in the moment that they forget who they are. If you forget you're a mother, you're going to act like you're single. If you forget you're a father, you're going to act like you're a bachelor. When you forget who you are, you act like somebody you're not. And James said, don't let the pressure of your situation turn you into someone you're not. Be consistent, be faithful, and in the end, you'll have no regrets. In the end, you'll look back and say, Phew, I don't regret anything I did because I stayed true. I stayed true. Back to James, someone say number two. He says, remember your future. Remember your future. I want to remind you that the people that James is writing to is being attacked for their faith. Some are being tortured. Some are being dragged out of their homes and imprisoned. And get this. This is powerful. Three times in the midst of their struggle, James reminds them that Jesus is coming back. Three times. Verse 7, he says, be patient until the coming of the Lord. Verse 8, he says, the coming of the Lord is near. Verse 9, he says, the judge is standing at the door. Right in the middle of dealing with horrible pain, James reminds them of their glorious future. 
He reminds them of their glorious future because he doesn't want their mind and their heart to be stuck in their present situation. Oftentimes the enemy will get us stuck on what's happening now and we forget what we got coming later. We forget what we got coming later and we make permanent decisions off temporary situations. And James says, don't forget, don't forget, Jesus is coming back. Get your eyes off your current situation. Look towards your glorious future. This is what the Bible calls hope. This is what the Bible calls hope. Hope is a confident expectation of good. It's a confident expectation of good. This is the benefit you have as a citizen of, of, of the kingdom of God. This is a benefit that you have that no matter what's going on around you, you have hope. No matter what they say about you, you have a confident expectation of good. This, we are gospel people. We are people of hope. We have this benefit. You better start using it. You better, oh, but you don't understand what it looks like. It doesn't matter. I'm closing my eyes. I got hope. I got a confident expectation of good. Oh, but you don't understand what they said. It doesn't matter. I know what he said. I know what he said. I have a confident expectation of good. We are people of hope. And hope says weeping may last for a night, but joy comes in the morning. That's the expression of hope. Weeping may last for a night, but guess what? The morning is coming. Joy comes in the morning. I, I think I shared this story with you before, but I'm going to share, share it again because some of y'all weren't paying attention the first time. But one of the most painful moments um, that I had in prison uh, was the two hours after visiting, visiting time in prison. Um, my wife, I love my wife. Um, she would visit me almost every weekend in the desert while I was in prison. And visiting is like a double-edged sword because you want to visit, you almost beg for a visit, and you get mad if they don't visit you. Hello. <laughs> but at the same time, after visiting, it's almost like torture because you got to separate from your family. And I was in a particular prison that for some reason, um, after I got back to my prison yard, there was a gate and I can see part of the long road that Laura would walk down as she kind of exited the prison. So oftentimes I'll be like a puppy at that door and I'll start doing sign language. I love you. I love you. And it's, and the, for the next two hours, you get depressed for the next two hours. There's just emotional stuff that goes on. Uh, you have to press through it. But I don't know how we picked it up. I don't know how we picked it up. But some point in time in our journey, the Lord gave us something that gave us strength. And we started to say, almost every time we separated, we started to say, we're one day closer to being home. We're one day closer to being home. I don't know where we picked that up at, but we started to say almost every time we separated, we're one day closer to being home. Almost one day closer to home. Every time we'd be on the phone, we have to hang up. We're one day closer to being home. We're one day closer to being home. Uh, she'd be walking down that long road. I'll be in prison. I'll be doing sign language. One day closer. Just one day closer to being home. And, and what that did was that for some reason that gave me strength. For some way, reason that gave me faith. Now, the reality was I still had about 13 years to do in prison times 365 days per year the reality was I still had a long day in prison but every time I said I'm one day closer to being home we're one day closer to being restored we're one day closer to being back together it gave me strength it gave me hope it gave me power to endure and I come to church this morning to let somebody know you're one day closer to getting your prayer answered you're one day closer to your breakthrough. You're one day closer to your son serving the Lord. You're one day closer to your daughter serving the Lord. You're one day closer for that promotion. You're one day closer to your family coming together. This is the benefit of hope that we have. We got privileges in the kingdom of God that some of us are not using. Now, James reminds them of the coming of the Lord and we are a church that believes in the imminent return of Jesus Christ. We believe that Jesus is coming back. And that's a whole teaching uh, of itself. But 
there are two things you need to think about when it comes to the Lord's return. Kind of two major things that I want to bring to your attention. When he tells them that Jesus is coming back, two primary things uh, that flows through our mind. Number one is your future blessings. If you're a child of God, you got some blessings on the way. If you're a child of God, you have some blessings on the way. If you're a child of God, no matter what it looks like right now, it's going to get better. Your struggle is not forever. Your pain is not forever. I want you to hang in there because sorrow is not forever. One day God is going to wipe away all the tears from our eyes. One day we're going to be fulfilled. One day we're going to have no more pain. We ain't going to have to worry about our bodies. We ain't going to have to worry about our minds. We ain't going to have to worry about what we eat. Amen. Because we got some future blessings. We got a mansion waiting for us. We got to remember this, that this is not it. We got some blessings. I got something coming. You got something coming. But the second thing we need to keep in mind is uh, your future judgment. Your future judgment. Um, the first time Jesus came, he came as a savior. But the second time he comes, he's coming as a judge. And James reminds us this by this almost scary verse in verse 9. He says, behold, the judge is standing at the door. He wants them to know, hey, it's serious business right here. The judge is standing uh, at the door. And so the question for us this morning is, are you ready to meet Jesus? Are you ready to meet Jesus? Are you right with God? If Jesus were to come back right now, would you be put to shame or would you be rewarded? Right? Are you ready to meet Jesus? Are you right with God? The Bible teaches in Hebrews 10, 31, it is a fearful thing to fall in the hands of a living God. Don't get it twisted. It's a fearful thing. To fall into the hands of a living God. And listen, we got, we got to talk like family. If you don't have Jesus in your life right now, if you have not surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ, when he comes the second time, you ain't got nothing coming. You ain't got nothing coming. The only thing you got coming is a lake of fire. That's the only thing you got coming the second time. If you don't have Jesus in your heart, if you're not following him, if you're not serving him, we're, we're trying to preach this thing to get you right with God. So that when Jesus comes, you don't have to be ashamed. So that when Jesus comes, you ain't got to go into that lake of fire. That you ain't got, you ain't got to go. You ain't got to go. And so let me kind of, kind of clarify some of this judgment that is going to go on just a little bit. Unbelievers will be judged for not having Jesus, but believers will be judged for what they did with Jesus. So if you're saved here today, you're not going to be judged on your salvation because you're already saved, you're secure. But what you're going to be judged about is what you did with Jesus. You're going to be judged for what you did with Jesus. What did you do with that extra 20 years God gave you? What did you do with that extra $20 God gave you? What did you do with that marriage God gave you? What did you do with that family God gave you? What did you do with that 15 more years of sobriety that God gave you? Because some of y'all know you should have been dead a long time ago. What did you do with Jesus that he put inside of you? That's what we're going to be judged for, believers. We're going to stand before God, and your spouse ain't going to be there. Your mama ain't going to be there. And God is going to pull out everything he placed inside of you. I don't know how he's going to do it, but if man could do it off a computer, if I could put up a sign up here, I know God could pull out your whole life. He's going to pull out everything he placed inside of you, every purpose, every goal, every dream. And he's going to say, what did you do with what I put inside of you? I gave you opportunity to advance my kingdom. I gave you opportunity to touch some lives. What did you do? Did you just get caught up in this world? Did you just spend 50 years working a job and never giving back to the kingdom of God? And he's going to pull out everything. This is why the Bible says we are to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Right. Work it out. In other words, we work out what God works in what God works in us. We are to work out of us. And let me challenge us this morning. I don't want to I don't want to go and meet God with stuff left inside of me. I want to lay it all out on the court. I want to take it all out on the court. At the end of the day, and that bell rings, I want it all out of the court. I want to be beat up. I want to be tired. Amen. I want to be I want to have wrinkles. I want to have gray hair. I want to I want to be used up for the kingdom of God. I want God to say, man, you did your very best with everything I placed inside of you. And let me just share, share this with you. If you're new here, listen, Chapel of Change is on a journey to impact the world with the gospel. So if you ain't got nothing else to do with the next 30 years of your life, I encourage you to just get them more. Just get, get, get connected and impact the world with us. Amen. I got one last thing that I'm going to share as I close. Someone say number three. Stop grumbling. Stop grumbling. 
Look at verse 9, what he says. He says, Be, Beloved, do not grumble against one another so that you may not be judged. Grumbling is an expression of impatience. It's an expression of harsh judgment. It's an expression of discontent. It's an expression of complaining. Nobody likes a complainer. Nobody likes a complainer. If, 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 if you have a spirit of complaining, people are going to avoid you. People are going to turn the other way. Nobody, nobody likes a complainer. I want to show you something, what he says in the text that is often overlooked. Look at this. I want to show you this. Uh, look at what he says in verse 9. Beloved, do not grumble against the unbelievers that are persecuting you. I want you to notice what's in the text because he does a little switch that if you just rush through it, you won't catch it. Remember, he's starting off by writing to people that are being persecuted for their faith. They're being persecuted by the world. Verse 9, he kind of switches up and he says, Beloved, do not grumble against one another. Notice, he doesn't say, do not grumble against the unbelievers who are persecuting you. Do not grumble against the unbelievers that are killing you. That's not what he says. He says, do not grumble against one another. What? What do you mean by that? Well, guess what? If you as believers don't know how to endure affliction and pain, you will eventually turn on one another. They were turning on one another. They were being persecuted by the world. And because they didn't understand the pressure, no ha handle the pressure in a godly way, they started to turn on one another. Whenever you see brothers, Christian brothers fighting against one another, you can best believe you can trace it down to some type of frustration they haven't learned to deal with. And so they turn on each other and they bite one another. He says, don't grumble against one another. Grumbling reveals self-centeredness. Grumbling says, I am the center of the universe. Grumbling says, I am on the throne of the universe. And God does not like a grumbling spirit. Grumbling threats team, threatens teams. Grumbling threatens families. Grumbling even threatens churches. Hear me today, church family. Grumbling is one of the most prevalent sins in a church. You know why? Because it's usually disguised. It's disguised. You know what it's disguised as? Sometimes it's disguised as a prayer request. I just want you to pray with me about this brother. I just want you to pray with me about this sister. It's disguised. And usually it's disguised uh, as, as the statement of, I'm just letting off some steam. I need somebody to talk to. Or it's disguised through the phrase, I'm just keeping it real. I just, just gotta keep it real. This brother, da, 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 da. It's harmful. It's not helpful. It's how the devil begins to tear us apart. It's how the devil begins to put cracks in our armor. So remember, I just wanna remind you, I wanna remind you, when we grumble, we crumble. When we grumble, we crumble. When a team starts to grumble, the team starts to crumble. When a family starts to grumble, the family starts to crumble. When a marriage starts to grumble, the marriage starts to crumble. When a church starts to grumble, it starts to crumble. A church doesn't just fall apart. It starts with cracks. And the cracks are complaining, grumbling, and murmuring. Be careful, because God does not like a grumbler. Doesn't like it. You study for yourself. The book of Exodus. The people of God begin to grumble against Moses. Grumble against God. You know what God did? God, the, the earth opened up and swallowed them up. Be careful. God does not like a grumbler. In fact, in Philippians chapter 2, verse 14, it says, Do all things, all things, all things, all things. Not just convenient things. Not just things you like. Not just easy things, but do all things without grumbling or disputing. May the Lord help us, help us not to grumble. Let's bow our heads. With every head bowed and every eye closed, as the worship team 
um, comes back up just for a couple moments. I want us to reflect upon the word of the Lord this morning. What was it that the Lord was trying to get across to you? And how will you respond? This is what I want us to think about while everybody remains seated in the presence of the Lord. What was it that the Lord was trying to get across to you? And how will you respond? What was it that the Lord was trying to get across to you and how will you respond? With every head bowed and every eye closed, if there's anybody in the house this morning who, through the preaching of God's word, you recognize that you have not been responding correctly to situations. You recognize through the preaching of God's word, you've been acting out of character. Maybe you've been grumbling. Maybe you have forgotten who you were in moments of weakness. If you're here this morning, and through the preaching of God's word, you realize you have not been responding correctly, but you want to repent of that and you want to make a commitment to the Lord that you will do as James instructed us, which is to remain the same. Don't allow a situation to transform us into someone else, which is to re remember our future. And you want to make a commitment that I'm going to I'm going to prayerfully deal with the grumbling in my life. I'm going to wrestle it down to the glory of God. If that is you, I want to pray with you. And I want to ask that you just stand up at your feet as a sign of faith and acknowledgement before the Lord. If you're in the house today and you need to repent from grumbling or not responding correctly to situations or even people, but you're making a commitment today to follow the instructions of James Stand on your feet and we'll pray together. <clears throat> For those of you who stood up, I want to ask that you just say this prayer with me from your heart. Lord God, I am sorry. I messed up. I haven't been responding the way I should. I ask for forgiveness this morning. I repent for my sins this morning. I make a commitment to be true to who you called me to be. I make a commitment to wrestle down the grumbling in my life. Help me, Lord, to close my mouth. Help me, Lord, to be faithful to you that I might be a good testimony for the kingdom of God in Jesus name let me pray for you father God I pray for all my brothers and sisters who stood up Lord you know their struggle I ask for strength Lord I ask for strength and hope I ask that you help them by your power to wrestle down the grumbling in their life I pray that you help them to acknowledge it when it comes to identify it when it comes and to wrestle it down by the power in the name of Jesus Help us, Lord, to respond correctly that we might be a good testimony to your kingdom. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray. Amen and amen. Let's give the Lord a hand praise. You may be seated in the kingdom of God.